Welcome to The Happy Brain, the podcast that answers your questions about the happy brain chemicals, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, and endorphin. Hi, I'm Loretta Bruning, founder of the Inner Mammal Institute and author of Habits of a Happy Brain, Retrain Your Brain to Boost Your Serotonin, Dopamine, Oxytocin, and Endorphin Levels. I hope you enjoy our show today, and if it raises any questions in your mind, feel free to send them to me, either through the contact form at the Inner Mammal Institute, which is innermammalinstitute.org, or contact me on Facebook, and you're invited to enjoy our Facebook discussion group with the Inner Mammal Institute, or my daily Facebook message on Loretta Bruning PhD page. Now, enjoy the show. Hi, thanks for joining us. I'm here today with Zach Klapman, who's a media producer for Car Enthusiasts. Hi, Zach. Hi, Loretta. Thank you very, very much for having me. Well, people may be wondering why I'm talking to a media producer for Car Enthusiasts, and I'll explain. Zach came to me with the very plausible theory that the reason people get excited about driving old cars is because there's more dopamine involved in uh, the action, the effort of driving. And um, I always want to be as agreeable as possible, but I didn't really agree with that theory. So I presented my alternative and And Zach got it so quickly that I wanted to talk to him more. So, (laughs) um, uh, Zach, why don't you first tell your your theory, just to give it a fair. Sure, of course. Um, You know, so I'm doing a story for Road and Track about an old car versus a new car and why, why so many of us car enthusiasts like driving older cars. It's a very common thing for automotive journalists and people to say like, oh, the old version of this car was much better and more fun than the new version. doesn't matter what company made it, doesn't matter how fast or slow it is. It's just something that every one of us seems to say. And so I thought it was because of the, the volume of work you're doing. So if you're driving an older car with a manual transmission, you know, you, you one hand is shifting the car, the transmission, one hand can be steering, And at the same time, one foot can be operating the brake or gas, and the other foot is operating the clutch. So in my head, you're using four of your limbs at once, plus your brain, and it's requiring more brain power and more physical work. And so maybe that's why we like it better. And I remember I had, I don't know if I presented this to you, but I had started researching how many nerves there are in the hands and the feet and the and versus other parts of the body. And I thought it was tactile feedback and all these other things that connect to the brain. And um, as you explained, that is not the case uh, <laughs> at all. <laughs> Did I, 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 or no, well, you, you said that the, sorry, that the reason we enjoy them so much is probably not because of the amount of work, but is actually because of something else. Well, I said that work triggers dopamine when you anticipate a reward. So for me, if I were doing all that extra work to drive a car, it's not linked in my mind to a reward, but somehow it is linked to a reward in your mind. And I Mm -hmm. asked you if you could think of how, with the caveat that these reward perceptions are linked in childhood. So I bet you had a childhood early experience with a car enthusiasm being rewarding and not to mention just you, but um, other hobbyists. And you said that you did think of plenty of examples, again, not just yourself, but others. So we'd love to hear one or two of those examples. Of course. Um, So for me, the earliest memory. By the way, I should tell people, since they're not looking at you, that he's a really cute young guy, just in (laughs) case you may be thinking he's 85 years old and that's why he likes old cars. Uh, No, no, yeah, I'm 38 at this point. I think one of my earliest memories was um, a neighbor had a car from an amusement park, like a li- one of those little cars that you drove around as a kid that they usually, you know, bolt to a bar and everyone goes in a circle and they had been able to take it home and like drive it in their field. And I rode with their son. I was like four, but I just remember we're driving in this field in this little buggy thing and how fun it was. And then with my dad, when I was about six years old, when I would sit in the front passenger seat, because this was before that was frowned upon, um, he would let me shift the truck 
when, wow. you know, while he drove. Wow. Yeah. So I'm being handed wow. this, this <laughs> cool responsibility, right? Like now I'm, I've in my brain, I'm like, oh, wow, I'm almost driving because I'm moving this lever when he says, you know, says, okay, shift now. And then shift was now. Was this one of those really old trucks where the shift lever was a really long, big yes. thing? Yeah, wow. it was a 1979 um, International Scout. And yeah, the shift lever is two feet long on that truck. It's, it's really, it's really big. And what kind of road were you on? Um, pretty, a pretty narrow road. Our house was out in the middle of like the woods. So okay. we have like a dirt road and then okay. a very small windy road. Yeah, not and then highway eventually. But he didn't let you shift on the highway, did he? I don't think he did. No, it was just first and okay. first and second gear kind of around. Okay. Our neighborhood. But anyway, this is a great example because it's, as you said, the physical movement. So imagine you're a six year old kid and you're actually physically doing that activity. Now, the way I break it down, as you know, now he, he read my book in the past yeah. couple of days. <laughs> um, the pride that a six year old would feel like, where else could a six year old get? that much power, but also that much respect that your father would accord you that much respect to let you do something so important. Yes. So now later, later car experiences after that. Um, uh, I think when I was nine, my, my neighbor, he just showed me that an old Jeep they had and how to turn it on. And that it was like a, it was a, almost like a secret because the, the Jeep, the Jeep didn't need to be used, turned on with a key. He was like, don't tell anybody, but the oh. so old you don't need a key. <laughs> and it was, and I was like, oh my God. And I just, you know, I still remember how cool that was that I knew that you could drive this, this Jeep without a key if you wanted to. Uh, I never did that, of course. Um, mm -hmm. And then I just, I think that's where it all began. I just became, I was just really in love with cars. My, my family are, they're not a family of car people. So I was kind of the black sheep in that way, but those things connected with me. And then I sought them out however I could. Um, and then when I was 15, my best friend had, he was a little older and he had an old truck that, you know, he could afford and we'd work on it. So I learned how to work on things and work on go-karts, um, stuff like that. So I just, I had people around me that were either mechanically inclined or, you know, interested in cars and then exposed me to that. And I connected with those moments really strongly. Great. Now, again, the point here is not for people to connect with cars, but for people to understand the importance of hobbies and our path to happiness in activating happy chemicals. And Zach is one of those people that everybody dreams of making this hobby into their career, which he's managed to do. But, you know, that's not going to work out for everyone. But everyone can find happiness through hobbies. However, you can't force yourself to like something. So I can't force myself to enjoy cars. And my husband is always playing the piano. He loves it. He can't stop. I can't force myself to like the piano. So how does a person get enjoyment in their life? Often they have to think more carefully about those early experiences. And you are not intellectually deciding, oh, this would be a good thing to like. You were liking it because it gave you a moment of importance. And for a young kid, there aren't that many opportunities to be important. So that's what turns everyone on is those early moments of importance. Now, what about your readers when you try to connect to readers about who are car enthusiasts and they share their stories? Do you have any interesting ones? Um, yeah, one of my friends, I, I, I told him this theory I was working on. And then after I spoke to you and I, I kind of presented him you know, this new theory. And he just went, yep. He, and he had an immediate example. He said, you know, when I was, uh, when I was 13, when he was 13, his stepdad had an old Corvette and he would take him out for rides in it and stuff. And then when this kid became 15, old enough to drive, he'd get home from school early and take the Corvette out before anybody else got home. And the stepdad knew about it, but never mentioned it and nothing bad ever happened. The kid was always really responsible. It was just like the secret they shared. Um, and he, of course, felt like the coolest kid in school because he's driving around in a Corvette when everybody else is like walking to school or whatever. And so he he immediately agreed with, with what I was saying and what you've been saying. Great. 
Now, I know that many readers may have a negative reaction to that because the whole idea of tying one's ego to the value of one's car is very frowned on these days. And yet, it's such a widespread phenomenon. And there's a reason for that is because the animal brain cares about status. Mm -hmm. And because our neural pathways are built when we're young. So how does a kid understand status? Now, you are giving me a total deja vu of Ferris Bueller's Day Off. You almost <laughs> feel like that movie was written about him. Yeah. Um, but the bottom line is everyone listening can think about what gave you a sense of importance when you were young. And the, the flip side of that is when you're young, what gives other people an advantage, like their car is bigger than yours, their soccer record, you know, a point scored is bigger than yours, their grade point average is better than yours. So this is how we wire in those bad feelings. And that's why mm -hmm. To feel better, we revert back to anything that made us feel good in the past. So I don't know if you have an example of car enthusiasts being especially eager to, to participate in that hobby when they're feeling bad about something else, to have that as a self-soother. Oh, um, 100%. A lot of people will say that going for a drive clears their mind. Um, it makes them, you know, fixes a bad day. It's a way you can, you know, express yourself. It's an outlet is what it is. You know, especially if you, if you have a fast car and you go for a, you know, aggressive drive in a safe way. Um, I did that a lot in high school. I'd be in a bad mood because I was a high school, you know, kid and we're jerks, <laughs> especially boys. And you, you know, go out for a loud drive going too fast. And it was just a way to like get rid of, anxiety or anger or whatever other energy you had going on. And I have friends still that are in their forties, fifties that do the same thing today. Absolutely. So um, one more thing, people are probably thinking the oxytocin aspect of this. So oxytocin is bonding. And I have the funniest example of this and you probably have better ones. So um, when I, I grew up in New York and I moved to California later in life and went to like the, the gold country for one of these weekends in the gold country. And it just coincidentally, it was a weekend when car collectors of a very specific model were having their convention that weekend. They don't call it a convention. I can't remember what they call it. So the streets of this tiny little town were suddenly full of people with this very specific old car and they were all driving around. And so we ran into one of them in a restaurant and we said, so what do you do at these? And he said, oh, this is it. We just drive yeah. around. <laughs> so tell us more about the, um, the bonding aspect of that. Uh, it's, you know, it's the car show or um, I think back in the, like back in the 50s, when people came back from the war, a lot of them bought cars from the 30s. That was the beginning of hot rodding. Oh. And a, a lot of um, young men that came back from war, you know, they're like this is when po Harley Davidson's got popular and hot rods got popular. And I think a lot of them were seeking a group because they had just come from a group. You know, they'd come from their kind of band of brothers. And so cars enabled them to have something that they could do together and focus on. Um, and kind of express themselves. And I know for me, I joined a muscle car club or a hot rod club when I was 16 because those are the cars I was interested in. I started going to car shows when I was a kid and everything there was a hot rod. And that was what, it's what you described. It's a bunch of people standing around looking at each other's cars, but they all feel like part of a tribe because they're like, well, we all like this thing and we share this interest and we can talk about it here. It's like, it's, uh, you know, if other, their friends might not be into it, but these, this group is. And so when I was 16, we were this, I don't know, group of 30 people that would get together, work on cars together, go drag racing. Um, and it, it felt like a safe place that you could talk about this hobby that maybe some of your other friends weren't really interested in. Wow, that's such a great example because when you're 16 years old, once again, there's not an unlimited number of out. Let's, and that's such a healthy outlet because it involves a skill. And that's very central to mm -hmm. my new book, 14 Days to Sustainable Happiness. When it involves a skill, because pride 
based on a skill is much healthier than pride based on, you know, the price tag of your car, because a skill mm -hmm. is something that um, positivity toward your own skill is the core of um, peace of mind to our inner mammal. Oh, so nice. you have this group and you guys really created it. And you knew that even though people didn't understand your excitement in not everybody, like in my life, all my regular family people, they don't have any interest in my Inner Mammal Institute. So we're always looking to connect with people who understand us on the particular thing we're excited about. Mm. And that's really the magic of social media, which is why it's so popular despite everybody bad mouthing it. Oh, that's okay. That's interesting. So the social media allows you to find a group and you know demonstrate something about you that this group appreciates. Whereas your, the other, your other friends may not. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Great. Good, good. Um, and um, just to reemphasize, um, distraction is also a big topic in my new book. So if you can enjoy this hobby in a moment when you feel bad about other things, it's very healthy as long as there's healthy use of distraction that you do need to solve the underlying problem, but first you need to give yourself time to chill out. So if you have a healthy way to chill out, much better than having unhealthy ways to chill out. So right. I think it's a very healthy thing. And that's why I like this example, because um, it's so easy for people to sneer at someone else's hobby. <laughs> and this is, um, particularly a hobby that's easy for people to sneer at. And so anyone listening who has a hobby that may be sneered at by others to help understand um, why it feels good and anyone who's looking for a hobby to, to understand what a valuable way it is to um, relieve distress. Yeah, it's always, it, working, like working on a car is either the most stressful thing in the world or the most rewarding, because if it goes wrong for, for too long, you know, if you spend eight hours on a project and then at the end, it's not fixed. Oh my gosh. It's, it's, it feels terrible. But in the long run, if you fix that problem, that is really rewarding. So it, sometimes you have to play a longer game than you were expecting. I've, I've definitely, I, I went out to the car with my girlfriend. I was going to fix something. I said, this will take 30 minutes. And like two hours later, we're still under the car and she's just rolling her eyes. Um, but when, when it goes to plan, yeah, it's, it's really rewarding because you've used the skill that you have developed or are developing. And then you're like, I did that. I made that work. That's great. That's such a perfect example of the dopamine aspect of all of this. Now, um, while I have you on the line, I'm going to selfishly use you for a solution to something that you might have an idea. Okay. Uh, so I live, um, uh, uh, not too far from a freeway and loud cars are going by. And I don't know if I'm the only one that has this feeling that since the pandemic, more people are driving super loud cars. Now mm. it may be just my imagination because there's fewer cars going by. So I hear, but I mean, people who are going out of their way to have cars that are really loud. And I don't see what's, what's, you're just hurting other people. You're not even benefiting yourself. And they do it at all hours. I don't think it should be legal. So this is my selfish perception, but what can we do about this? Um, well, that is a, that is a, uh, a bit of a loaded question. Um, I think there's a few things. During, during the height of the pandemic, there are a lot of people getting tickets in LA for going much faster than normal. So the, the CHP in Los Angeles wrote more speeding tickets at or over a hundred miles an hour in a month than they normally do in a year because the freeways were empty. So you had all these people enjoying those open freeways. So it's possible that, that cars are traveling at a higher rate of speed. Um, there's also, there are aftermarket parts people have been buying that have been making cars louder and like, I, I like aftermarket parts. It's a way that you can express your individuality with the car culture. Uh, but in the last couple of years, there have been these new th new parts added that make cars that are normally quiet, extremely loud. And I find it very annoying. And I used to drive a muscle car, but maybe it's the 
my age, but it's getting like way more obnoxious than it ever has been before. And um, I don't know if, if there can be laws passed about that because the, the thing with that is it's a very slippery slope. If you say we don't want cars to be over a certain volume in, in terms of noise, um, it can infringe on a lot of aftermarket manufacturers. It can infringe on the individuality of people to change their cars how they like. I think you might just have a lot of people in your area that drive like jerks. <laughs> it's very possible. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and also they may just have bad taste. I, when I see a lot of kids in LA, they're like 16 to 25 and they're much more full of that, like braggadocio testosterone. And they want to have the loudest thing around because they think it's so cool to just signal to everybody to look at them. And I just look and I kind of just tilt my head and I go, look, you're going to turn 26 and you're not going to do this anymore. It's just, it's like a phase that they're going through and then they'll come out the other side and go, Oh, I was obnoxious. Yes. I might have to it, wait. it is obnoxious. Yeah. It's obnoxious. <laughs> and by the time they're 26, there'll be a new crop of 16 year olds who might possibly. Well, by then the cars might all be electric. So then you won't have a, a noise problem anymore. Oh, good. Good. Uh, I don't know how they would feel about this, but the idea of, of asserting dominance by making loud noise is something chimpanzees do. Maybe they'll be less interested in doing that if they know that, but there are fabulous videos. When chimpanzees hear thunder, they don't know what thunder is. So they they perceive it as a, a rival who's making a loud noise. So they literally take sticks and bang them uh, on the ground to try to make loud noise to, to sort of uh, assert their dominance against this. Wow. Rival. <laughs> during the thunder. Isn't that hilarious? Yeah. yeah. So maybe you could tell them that. However, I, I think that another factor when you say the LA police were giving a lot of tickets, I think where I live, the police are not giving anyone tickets. They're not even policing much murder. So people have the perception that there's not much policing. And I think that might be part of it. Yep. Yeah, that probably does. There have been more instances of, um, this is a little off topic, but like these sideshows, people going out into the streets in their cars and doing donuts and drag racing and, and being more bold about it because there was less policing. It was a big problem down here a few years ago. I know it's been a very big problem in the in the, in the Bay Area as well. Um, I don't advocate that because it's what they're doing is very illegal and disruptive to traffic and possibly dangerous. Um, and those that's something that like the police department just has to find a way to crack down on. And I know mm-hmm. it's a challenge. I know it's a challenge for them. Mm-hmm. Now, I think people would love to hear the story of how you managed to make a career out of your passion, because that's a a path so many people are hoping for. What can you tell us? Oh, um, sure. Well, I was, uh, I'll give the condensed version. I was (laughs) being, and I went to university in Colorado and I had been there for a few years and I felt very aimless. Like I, you know, I, Graduated with a degree in communications because um, I, I was good at writing and presenting, um, except for right now. And I was just kind of aimless. And I, I just had this weird thought. I was like, I want to work in TV around cars. You know, those are the things I like. I like entertaining people and I like cars. So the only place to do that at the time was Los Angeles because YouTube didn't really exist at this point. It was a few years um, too early for that. And So what I did is I got here and then I just started looking for opportunities for that. I found a job listing on Craigslist that someone had an automotive blog and they needed a writer and it was very new and I was very new, but I I got a job writing for them. And then money, I, I, it's hard to imagine a blog paying money. It was like $10 a post. So it was, it was very low considering the amount of work that went into it, but I think that's what I want people to know. The stepping stones. well, the stepping stone, I mean, that job paid, but the next one I took that actually led to where I am today, we made no money for six years. I, I started working with a brand new YouTube channel. It was me and three people, and we all had gotten to LA about the same time. We wanted to do the same thing, and we all had this agreement. We're like, look, we we will not make enough money to pay anybody. We will work. We literally will work for sandwiches, but what we're doing is we're auditioning for television on the internet. We're just going to put up content. And if, and we think we're good at this, we have an eye for it. And eventually this will lead to something. And it did like we, we got a TV show, but then that went away for a little while. And then we, we were um, hired by a different YouTube channel to make content. And then that went away after two years. So there was lots of, you know, two steps forward, one and a half steps back. And what I, what I did 
and this was an internal thing. I just, I just knew what I wanted to do. And you just start taking almost involuntary steps in the right direction. And you start skipping things that won't help you get where you want to get. So you, so I started saying yes to basically any job that came across my desk that was in this realm. And I started turning down things that were either going to be a distraction or weren't going to move me in the right direction. Um, and, and I just did that for, you know, 2009 and starting then. And I mean, it was seven years before I had a good steady production job. I had some cool stuff that I did, but nothing that was like really paying bills. I was very lean. It was very lean for a very long time. But what I would say to people is if you figure out what you want to do and you really, really sure had set on it, just start walking in that direction and you'll start making decisions that will lead you closer to where you want to get. And then when you have opportunities, you have to just work really hard at them and, and you just keep going. Thank you. That was such a perfect explanation. That was great. And of course, that's also the point of 14 days to sustainable happiness is the small steps in that direction is all it takes. And when you mention about production, uh, probably also those production skills were self-taught. Yeah, I knew nothing about cameras. Um, and I, I worked with some people that knew a little bit, but we all learned at the same time. And just if with production, if you pay attention and work hard, that will get you a really long way. Like if you are, if you do things quickly, you don't make mistakes and you just pay attention. Like it's a system it's been doing, they've been making movies and TV for like a hundred years. Um, so just kind of watch what people do and you can mimic what they do and then you learn what they do and then you learn how to apply those skills, you know, at the next job or the next year or whatever. And, um, and, and now with, with YouTube, you can learn almost anything, like literally almost anything can be learned on the internet. So that will help you get much further in whatever hobby you want to turn into a job. Great, great. Now you said something that I found um, funny about uh, people always say old cars are better because my husband is always saying old computers are better. So <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> you know, they don't make them the way they used to seems to be a common theme, despite the fact that, you know, the reality is I think that often the new one is better. And even with computers, I try to point out to my husband, maybe if you have a new model where five things are better, but you, you, you lose one feature that you loved mm. and you feel that loss more than you celebrate the five new things you get because you, you, you're not yet wired to, to be used to those new things, but you're already wired about the thing you're losing. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. that's very interesting. I don't know, but my um, husband is always, whenever, like he's always praying for a new computer to come out. And then when it comes out, he just hates it and finds everything. <laughs> oh, it's so fast. And the battery lasts so long. This is terrible. Um, well, it's, it, so that's an interesting thing with what we're seeing right now with, in the automotive world is the loss of the manual transmission. The, many car companies don't offer many cars, if, if any, with a manual transmission anymore. And it's because when people buy a new car, they wanted an automatic. It's just the, the market spoke and it said 90% of people prefer an automatic. And what you're hearing in my world from people basically in their 20s and up is this morning, really. It's it's a constant cry for <laughs> why are they getting rid of the manual? Why don't they bring it back? And my answer is because people didn't buy it. It's very simple. If people bought it, they'd keep it. But the audience and the and car fans don't really want to accept that answer. So what you say is interesting that they're they're already wired to love this thing. So the removal of it hurts them more than the replacement that may be faster or better or, you know, objectively um, functions better. But Manual is better. popular in Europe. So what about, um, and, and it's funny to say, why would manual be popular in Europe? Well, originally it was popular because it was cheaper, but mm -hmm. then they developed the perception that automatic transmission is wasteful, like it's a decadent luxury that you don't need. And so manual transmission is the, the, the modest, intelligent thing. Oh, <laughs> Maybe okay. your friend should buy cars in Europe and bring them back. 
I actually, I wish I, I don't know the answer to this. I don't know what the, what the take rate is on automatics in Europe versus here, if it's changing there as well. Um, I know that like Ferrari are not making a car anymore that has a manual transmission and they sell those all over the world. Ferrari, this is years ago, they said, we're not doing it anymore because the percentage of customers that, that opted for the manual was in the single digits. So they can't justify the cost. Well, I don't know, maybe that's interesting, but Ferrari is, is maybe a more special thing. But when I go to Europe, if I rent a car, I don't want a manual car. It's hard enough for me to drive in Europe. Right. And sometimes they, oh, we, well, they're all manual. So I have to get into a big negotiation. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah. I don't know. When I've gone to Europe in the last few years, it's I've always gotten an automatic just by happenstance, but it just, it could also be the country or the town or it, 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 it just varies a lot. I know okay. that when they used to rent manuals, it was more expensive for the rental companies to maintain. Wow. Well, my information could also be out of date because something that happened literally, I think it was 15 years ago that maybe to me, that seems recent, you know, but I'll have to tell you this experience because you'll crack up. So my first driving in Europe, my whole life, because you know, I'm not often going to drive in another country, but in this case, I had a lot of time because my husband was in a lot of meetings, had a lot of free time, was in a rural area, I'd already seen all the sites. I rent a car, drive it, need gas pull into a gas station and never occurred to me that it was a diesel car. It was actually a Korean car. And I filled it with regular, not knowing it was a oh, diesel no. car. And um, I don't know, you could tell us better what would have happened, but I looked out that somebody walked by and, and sort of said to me, do you know what you did? And I was like, what? So this was like exciting for me because I got to use my French as the first time. Like I really had a, like a life or death use of my French, you know? So I discussed with a few different people and they managed to convince me that I better call a tow truck immediately and not turn on the car. Um, so it was a real urgent and real matter of urgency. And I just. Yeah, it would, it would break it. It would break it. Um, <laughs> You know, if you put diesel in a gasoline car or gasoline in a diesel car, the engines are completely different. The systems are different and it it will either not run for very long, if at all, or it just won't turn on, which would be great. But um, it can seriously damage the engine um, and possibly destroy it. So you got very good advice to, to call a tow truck because what they did is they drained your gas tank and then, you know, you fill it up with the fuel that you need. Uh, yeah, a top tip for anybody tra traveling to Europe is look up what gasoline and diesel are called in that country. Because I went to, I think, France and diesel is called gasole, which uh, looks like gasoline, but it is not. Exactly, exactly. Gas is petrol and then diesel is gasol, which sounds like gas, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Great, well, um, and my second driving experience in Europe, I went, I wanted to drive on the Autobahn in Germany. I was so scared because I've only heard, you know, scary things. I, I did it. Um, I stayed in the slow lane, it was fine. I didn't go crazy slow, um, but have you driven in any of these fast, high pressure places? I have, the Autobahn, for a person like me, is wonderful. It is the, <laughs> it is the, it is the mecca of highways. Um, and not just for the reason you think. I mean, this the speed is very, very fun for a person like myself. I've been there. I think I went 170 miles an hour. You're kidding. I'm not. No, not kidding. It, it, it's it's what it's a wonderful way to get around. Um, <laughs> is this day or night or what? Uh, this was daytime. And but the, you value the, your life. Absolutely. And that actually brings me to the next point. The great thing about the Audubon and German um, Germans driver education is that it is far superior to America and many other countries. They take it very seriously. And the Autobahn has a very strict order to the lanes. So you said you were in the slow lane, which is great. You were in the right lane. And in Germany, it is illegal to pass someone on the right side of their car, which if anyone listening has ever driven in America, we have a big problem now where people get in the left lane, they pick a speed they feel is fast enough. And then they sit there. And a lot of times they're going, 
the speed limit, you know, and most people like to drive, over, a lot of people like to drive more than the speed limit. You know, if the speed limit's 65, a lot of us go 70. Uh, and I have seen more and more people passing on the right side of cars because you have these lines of slow moving cars in the left because our brain is like, my assumption is the people get in that lane and they think I'm in the fast lane. I must be traveling as fast as possible or as fast as everyone should go. They kind of police it themselves. So the Autobahn is very, very serious about this. If you pass someone on the right, you could get pulled over and get a very large ticket. And what you'll notice there is there is such a good order that everyone, everyone does something that's predictable and it makes you feel very comfortable. So because you know that if you are in the middle or the right lane, cars will only pass you on the left, they have to flash their high beams or signal, you know that you are in a safe place. And you also know that if you're driving fast in the left lane and someone's ahead of you, they will see you and move over. So there's a very strict order to it um, that make, it made me feel much, much safer. Don't try this at home, people. Nope, <laughs> it is, it's only legal there and it's only legal in very specific places to go, right. to go that fast. Well, Zach, it was such a pleasure talking to you. So now um, feel free to tell everyone about your YouTube channel and um, the media that you produce. Thank you. Um, so the, the YouTube channel is called The Smoking Tire. It's hosted by myself and my friend, Matt Farah. We review cars, we compare cars together. Um, we also have an automotive podcast called The Smoking Tire Podcast, which is, you know, we feature racers, fabricators, journalists, stuff like that. We talk about news in the industry. And um, the article that I'm writing that's going to use a lot of your information is going to be on in Roden Tracks print magazine in about a month, and it'll be on the website as well. And I'm really excited to, to, to write it after you and I spoke. Like, I really am the different chemicals that you talk about, how that connects to so many different parts of, the, of people's car enthusiasm is just amazing. It's amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, it, it applies to everything because we're all mammals. Yeah, yeah, of course it does, right? <laughs> Great. And if people want to, uh, do you want to offer a, a website or something for people to get information? Yeah, um, follow me on Instagram. That's the easiest way. I'll post all my links there. And my Instagram handle is fake Zach Clapman because somebody else had real Zach Clapman. So just look up fake Zach Clapman. I'm definitely the only one of those. And that's Z A C K K L A P M A N. Yes. Thank you. For, thank you for spelling that for them. Yes. Yeah. Well, I know yeah. different spellings of Zach's. Great. Great. Well, it was such a pleasure talking to you and um, look forward to seeing that article. Yeah. Thank you so much for your insight and assistance. Uh, I think it will surprise a lot of my readers and, uh, and friends. <laughs> great. Take care. Bye. It was great to have you with us today. We hope you'll keep learning about your inner mammal and keep checking out the resources of innermammalinstitute.org. We have books, videos, blogs, and graphics that will help you build power over your mammal brain. Help us spread the word by reviewing and subscribing to our podcast and checking out our books and videos. And do join us live on Sundays so you can ask your questions about rewiring your happy brain chemicals details at innermammalinstitute.org slash podcast.